Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Wendy Griffith. Today, President Biden heating up his attacks on Trump supporters. The president taking off the gloves on the campaign trail. But the extreme MAGA Republicans in Congress have chosen to go backwards. Meanwhile, a victory for former President Trump in his legal battle over the documents seized in the FBI raid on his Florida estate. It's a known fact most Americans just aren't getting the sleep they need. As our society has gotten busier and busier and we're all available 24 seven with devices that connect us all the time, most Americans don't get enough sleep. And one reason it's important, the American Heart Association has added sleep to its list of indicators of good heart health. It's a place of refuge for migrants from all corners of the earth. God gave me a dream that I had to build a church. We worked for eight months, day and night. We knew God was going to do something special, but nobody had a clue about what really was going to happen. So how did this dream of a safe haven in a church in Tijuana, Mexico, become a reality? And worship leader and author Sean Foy talks about his new song called Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God, and how he wrote it after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. And we begin with President Biden once again blasting supporters of former President Trump on the campaign trail. But Trump got a big win in court Monday. A federal judge ordered the Justice Department to stop going through documents seized in the raid on his Mar-a-Lago home. The judge granted his legal team re uh, request for a special master to review those documents. Tara Mergener takes a look at the impact of the judge's decision. The decision authorizes an outside legal expert to review the records. The judge's order also reveals that some of the documents taken by agents include hundreds of personal, medical and tax records, which played a role in the decision. Citing unprecedented circumstances, Judge Aileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, says it's necessary to ensure the integrity of an orderly process amidst swirling allegations of bias and media leak. In a particular blow to the Justice Department, the order also says Trump can assert claims not only of attorney-client privilege, but also of executive privilege. The decision to name a special master is an early win for Donald Trump because it means that there will be an independent set of eyes. Cannon has ordered the Justice Department to stop reviewing the records as part of its criminal investigation. So that means the DOJ can do certain investigative work, but it can no longer inspect or review the documents until basically the judge says so. However, investigators can continue conducting their review into whether the records could pose any damage to national security if exposed. The decision comes after the raid found more than 11,000 government documents, more than 100 marked classified. In her ruling, Cannon says Trump faces the stigma of having had his home searched, and any future indictment based on the seizure of those records would cause reputational harm. With midterms just several weeks away, Trump blasted the Biden administration at a rally this weekend to revved up supporters. A few weeks ago, you saw it, when we witnessed one of the most shocking abuses of power by any administration in American history. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. Meanwhile, President Biden continues to target Trump supporters on the campaign trail, hoping to turn out Democrats in force come November. The extreme MAGA Republicans in Congress have chosen to go backwards, full of anger, violence, hate and division. But together, we can and we must choose a different path. As for the judge's order, it comes despite strenuous objections by the Justice Department, which said a special master was not necessary in part because officials had already reviewed potentially privileged documents. In Washington, Tara Mergener, CBN News. Thanks, Tara. California will face its highest chance of blackouts this year as a brutal heat wave continues to blanket the state with triple digit temperatures. Temps have been running 20 degrees above normal for, for nearly a week with little relief in sight. We've now entered the most intense phase of this heat wave. We know it's been a long haul and it's about to get even more difficult. 
With the demand for power running so high, the state may need power blackouts. The scorching heat and low humidity were also drying out brush and adding to the challenges of battling wildfires. Some 4,400 firefighters were battling 14 large fires around the state, and there were 45 new blazes on Sunday alone. Well, there's no question that sleep is an important part of a healthy lifestyle. Recently, the American Heart Association emphasized the importance of sleep by adding it to a number of indicators of good heart health. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson explains why sleep is so important. To show the powerful connection of sleep to a healthy heart, the American Heart Association is adding sleep to its overall key measurements. It joins diet, exercise, blood glucose, body mass index, blood lipids, blood pressure, and nicotine exposure. Most health experts and institutions recommend adults get seven to nine hours of sleep each night with few to no interruptions. Bodies need that time to repair and reset. Cardiologist Deepak Talraja says these days most Americans get much less sleep than in past generations. As our society has gotten busier and busier and we're all available 24-7 with devices that connect us all the time, most Americans don't get enough sleep. Dr. Talraja tells patients the path to better sleep begins with the right environment. The bedroom should be dark cool and quiet. Then establish your best bedtime and stick to it. Set an alarm each night to remind you, just like you have a wake-up alarm, a go-to-sleep alarm can be very helpful. Stay away from electronics well before bedtime and silence them to avoid interruptions during the night. And if you do wake up, stay away from the smartphone. We're tempted to pull our device quickly if we're having a little bit of a hard time sleeping and look at Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or do things that, one, introduce light into our environment and, two, rev us up instead of letting us calm down. Exercise is also very important to a good night's sleep. Severino Tiaba now works out daily and goes to bed at 9 p.m. Now, since I'm getting older, it's routine. You know, the kids are out of the house. It's me and my wife. Tiaba made a lot of other changes after suffering a heart attack six years ago. My chest was burning real bad. And, uh, man, and I had my wife take me to the emergency room because I felt like I needed to get checked out. And it just got, got worse. That near-death experience convinced this beer-drinking, cigar-loving, junk food junkie to do a 180. You know, I want to be around to see my grandkids. Tiaba started by following Dr. Talraja's advice to switch to a heart-healthy diet. I eat a lot of fruits, a lot of vegetables, a lot of grains. Uh, no more red meat, no more pork. So I eat a lot of, a lot of cold water fish, salmon, mackerel, and poultry. Plus, he gave up alcohol except an occasional glass of red wine and ditched the cigars. The biggest risk factor for heart disease in this era is still smoking. So quitting smoking is far and away the single most important thing a person can do. And while Dr. Talraja hopes all his patients try this hard... He says, I'm a miracle case. <laughs> He says those who feel intimidated about making radical changes all at once can take it slow and tackle them one by one. So while heart disease remains a major issue, taking this approach could mean a lot less of it. If we could get the average American to eat better, exercise, pay attention to their other health risk factors, and sleep better. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Very great advice. Well, coming up, a place of refuge for migrants from all corners of the earth. More than 35,000 of them have passed through the doors of this church in Tijuana. So how did this dream of a safe haven come true? We'll tell you when we come back. A God-given dream led Gustavo Banda to start a small church in Tijuana, Mexico. He and his wife never imagined it would become a refuge for tens of thousands of migrants seeking freedom in America. Yet that's exactly what happened. George Thomas shows us how that dream 
became a reality. Six miles from Tijuana and a short distance from the U.S.-Mexico border lies one of this city's poorest neighborhoods. This area is on the outskirts of the city. Not everyone knows about it. Not everyone wants to come here either. It's easy to see why. There are no paved roads. The hillside is strewn with garbage. There's no sewage system here, and crime is rampant. When we moved here, there were only cows, horses, chickens, and people with a lot of needs. In 2011, Gustavo Banda and his wife, Zaida Gulen, moved to Canon de Alacran, or Scorpion's Canyon, after hearing from the Lord in a dream. It was a clear mandate from God to move here, even though there was absolutely nothing in this place. Teachers by trade, the Mexican couple, were touched by the overwhelming needs of the community. Most folks here were poor subsistence farmers. God gave me a dream that I had to build a church. We worked for eight months, day and night. We knew God was going to do something special, but nobody had a clue about what really was going to happen. That year, Templo Embajadores de Jesus, or Ambassadors of Jesus, was born in the heart of Scorpions Canyon. Banda held services on Sunday, then hit the rugged roads the rest of the week, going house to house, ministering to physical and spiritual needs. We shared the love of Jesus with them. It was a mandate from God that we had to go to the poor. In 2016, that focus drastically changed when thousands of Haitians, escaping poverty and back-to-back -back natural disasters, began to carve a dangerous 7,000-mile path to the U.S.-Mexico border. Many landed on the church's doorsteps, less than 30 minutes from the San Isidro border. Within months, 22,000 Haitians had arrived in the city of Tijuana. The church became a place of refuge. I did not know, nor did I ever imagine, that there would be so many people in the church. Since then, Banda has opened his church doors to migrants from all parts of the world. It started with migrants coming from Haiti, Africa, Pakistan, and the Middle East. Today, we mainly have people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Colombia, and some from Mexico. It's hard to tell, but we estimate about 35,000 people have come through the church easily. 1,200 were staying in the church the day CBN News visited. We feed them three times a day. We try to help them with all their needs. At nighttime, the entire church becomes one big giant dorm where everyone sets up their beds on the floor and sometimes there's no room to even walk on the floor. Redding Castillo from Honduras has been here for four months. He says gangs killed his father and threatened to take his life as well. Thank God that I'm not in danger anymore. They are not sending me the threatening messages like they used to. 24-year-old Jacqueline Ortiz from Guatemala is here with her two girls. I'm so thankful to God because if these doors of the church weren't open, I don't know where I would be. I don't go hungry here. My daughters don't go hungry. We have a warm place. We have a roof. And all thanks to God and to the people that help us. Most migrants stay here an average of six months before trying to legally cross the border. Church volunteers run a school for the children, oversee computer training, and provide other skills that will help migrants prepare for their new life in America. Area churches and NGOs also pitch in with food and other essential supplies. The most important thing for the migrants to know when they get here is that there is hope. And although they have left their families behind, all of us that are here have become their family. Come Sunday, everyone picks up their bed and dresses up for a lively church service. I know that I only have a little bit of time with them, so my job is for them to know as much as they can about Jesus, baptize them, and send them to the United States believing in Jesus. Pastor Gustavo started the church back in 2011 with no idea that uh, he would be housing thousands of migrants from around the world. 
So today, 10 years later, a new structure is going up, which will be the future home for the migrants. He once had a desire to be a missionary to Haiti. Not anymore. I even started learning a little bit of the language. But when I wanted to go to Haiti, Haiti came to me. And after Haiti came, all the other nations started coming to this place. I don't have the numbers, but for years we have been baptizing so many of them. And many more are surrendering to Jesus. And that's my calling now. George Thomas, CBN News, in Scorpions Canyon, Tijuana, Mexico. Thanks, George. Still ahead, worship leader and author Sean Foyt talks about his new song, Imago Dei, and how he was inspired to write it after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. We'll hear from him about that and how he says God is bringing revival to America right after this. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. After Roe versus Wade was overturned, worship leader and author Sean Foyt was inspired to write a song that celebrates life. It's called Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God. Recently, he joined CBN's The Prayer Link program to talk about the song and how God is bringing revival to America. <laughs> Share the story behind this beautiful song and the video and everything. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I... I, I, to be honest, I, you know, I've been praying for for the re overturning of Roe v. Wade since I was a teenager. I mean, I have this life band on. I've had this one on for 10 years. I had one on before this for 12. Um, but I was so discouraged when it finally happened because the response of the church was so weak. I mean, it was pathetic. People were like not not celebrating here. I'm thinking we should have millions of Christians dancing around the, the streets of America. You know, God answered a 50 year prayer request. And I was really disheartened, you know, that the, that people were almost a, a shameful to say anything, whatever. And I was about to get on Twitter and Facebook and just start raging on <laughs> the state of the church. And and the Lord spoke to me and he said, sing the song of life over a generation. Remind them that they are made in my image. And, I, you know, songs will go to places that sermons and tweets will never go. You know, they'll touch the human heart. And so the journey of me saying, okay, I'm going to take this frustration and I'm just going to remind people that they're made in the image of God. And so that that's kind of where the song came from. And I, of course, wanted to incorporate my own kids into the process as well. <laughs> and I'm it's telling great. you, you did a masterful and beautiful job, Sean. And you also recently oh, shared a you. clip of you worshiping with lawmakers at the U.S. Capitol. Let's listen to that. Yeah. <laughs> What was it like there? What was that like? It was amazing. I mean, the Lord has like, he's been setting this up, you know, um, he, over the last few years. I mean, you guys may know I, I did have a, a run for Congress back in 2020 in California. And I felt like maybe that how that's how God was leading me to impact the government. But now I see that, you know, God's done his sneaky thing that he always does. And he's <laughs> using worship and my call to worship to bring it inside the Capitol. So this is not the first time we've done that, but I mean, it, it was amazing to be in that building where the decisions are made that affect our lives every single day. And yet we're gathering together with, uh, you know, with, with congressional leaders, with aides, and we're calling on the name of Jesus. And, you know, all of them, I think are saying what all, we all think, you know, God is the only hope at this point in America especially with a lot of these bills that we see coming down, God is our only hope. And so mm -hmm. it was just so special to get together in that building because we believe the presence of God can permeate and change things in that space. Amen. 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 No doubt. Sean, let's talk about revival. Prayer leader Lou Engel, I know he's a spiritual father to you. Uh, he believed mm -hmm. that Roe v. Wade had to be overturned before God would bring revival to America. Now that that's mm -hmm. happened, do you believe we will see more people coming to Jesus and perhaps, you know, real revival in America? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, it was a curse. It was a it was child sacrifice. It's a death decree that was hanging over the nation. You know, we're, uh, only China and North Korea are worse, mm -hmm. you know, on their abortion rules. I mean, that puts us in not very good company <laughs> in right. America. and. Yeah. 
And so we have that death decree that's been hanging over the nation. And 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 to see that reverse in my lifetime, and of course now the battle goes to the states, and we're starting to see these victories. You guys mentioned at the beginning of the show in, in Indiana, we're going to see more of those. Uh, but I think it's huge. I think it's massive breakthrough, and I think it does begin to, you know, uh, God doesn't bless wicked nations. We've seen mm-hmm. this throughout history. And so now that we've taken a stand that, you know, that the Supreme Court has made that decision, I, I do see, believe we're going to see the effects of that. Sean, really uh, quickly, also, we're going to go. demonic getting crazy and worshipers rising up. All right, Sean also has a new documentary coming out called Super Spreader. It's about his Let Us Worship movement, and it will be in select theaters on September 29th. So check your local listings. Coming up, a Brazilian fisherman goes out for a routine three-day trip. Instead, he ends up stranded in rough waters. We'll tell you how he survived when we come back. Stranded in rough waters in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Brazilian fisherman Romoldo Macedo Rodriguez went uh, out for what was supposed to be a three-day fishing trip in early August, but his boat had cracks and quickly filled with water. So he used the ship's freezer as a floating device. He was in the water for 11 days before the Coast Guard rescued him by helicopter from some rocks off Dog Island on Sunday. He was then taken for medical assistance. He told Record TV, quote, I couldn't take it anymore. One more day and I would die inside that freezer. He reportedly survived without any food or water. Thankfully, a group of fishermen eventually found him. Praise God happy ending. Well, that's it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel anytime or online with CBNNews.com. Also, tell us what you think about the stories you've seen today. You can email us at newswatch at CBN.com or talk to us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next time. From all of us here, have a great day and God bless.